Oh, it is gonna be a mess on this workbench. I was milling late into the night and uh, this is what it looks like. Not as bad as I remember. Show you what I got done last night. Got this uh, relief machined in. This is for that uh, crane clamp. Got all these holes tapped but then my tap broke off in this one. So I'm gonna have to put a new hole, although actually I don't have a tap anymore. So I guess I'll just use three screws. Got taps on that side. Now I just gotta machine this piece for the other side of the clamp. That should be pretty easy. Um, yeah, and so it's kind of tricky. You wanna line these holes up with these holes, right? And you got to do it pretty exact because you have to line all four up. If one of them's slightly off, <clears throat> it's not going to work. So what I've been doing is I've marked with an arrow there. That's the front. And I know this is marked with an F, so that's the front there. So this would actually go this way, and this would go like so. And then these holes would all line up. And basically, which is this is not the way. I guess a pro would do it, but essentially this piece goes in here. That piece goes in there, and then I have this hand wheel here. Here's a lock. I have a hand wheel here that I can spin, and this essentially moves around, right? And on the hand wheel, <coughs> there, hey, that's rude. On the hand wheel, there are markers in thousandths of an inch. And what I've been doing is I'll zero it out, say, with the bit right on the edge here. Kind of not, doesn't really matter where you start. I mean, it needs to be close, but what matters is from the first thread to the second to the third to the fourth. Once I zero it out, I spin the handle 17 times <clears throat> to get to the first thread. That's kind of an arbitrary number. From there, though, I spin it 30 times for each uh, subsequent thread. And then when I go to this part, I do the same thing. I try and get as close to 17 as possible for the first one, and then I go 30, 30, 30. So then when you line it all up, it should be perfect, and it is, you know, within a couple thousandths of an inch. So that was kind of satisfying to get right. I'm going to do a little cleanup real quick and then finish the last of this clamp. sometimes inscribe it in the actual metal because the uh, marker can rub off. This is a cool tool too. You just push it on whatever piece of metal and it pops and it puts a hole right where you put the point so you can start a drill bit in that and it'll stay centered. So I gotta go 17, 30, 30, 30. I'm going to grab a parallel right here. It's called parallels. They're two pieces of identical metal. And you put them in the vise. Getting all the little chunks of stuff off of them. Put them in the vise to hold a, a thinner piece of metal up high. So you don't uh, drill into the bottom of your vise. So I put the 
layout fluid down. I take my calipers to 6.35. I'll go a little over just because this kind of marking method takes up some of that space because you're at an angle. And I just draw a crude line down the center. Now I can line up my bit. with that line. Hopefully, again, there's better ways to do this, but it doesn't need to be perfect here. Do a little dot. Looks pretty good. Right, so I'm just, by eye, I'm lining it up here. Then, I'm gonna zero out my indicator. So now I can do 17 turns to drill my first hole. So I'm just going to go one, two, three, four, 17, right there. There's 17, now I'm gonna turn it 30 turns. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to, since this is still lined up where it was, I'm going to countersink this so that when I put this bolt in, the head is flush with the surface. helicopter coming over. A little bit of scotch bright really uh, gives it a nice kind of brushed finish. I built this sink during the quarantine out of wood and epoxy, like a bar top material to keep it waterproof. So just plumbed it into an existing plumbing that was here from an old sink. And so far it hasn't leaked. It's kind of crude, but I just wanted something that was kind of narrow so it didn't interfere with the washer dryer. I even labeled the date. 
five six twenty twenty pandemic. So yeah, it's been good. Okay, got a little to do list here. Test fit this bracket. Drop this off at FedEx. Dangerous goods. Had to put all the warning labels on it. just picked up my laundry. I've never done fluff and fold before, but since my washer's broken, uh, I didn't want to sit around for like two hours at a laundromat because I had a lot to do. So for 30 bucks, $15 an hour, I feel like that's a pretty good valuation of time. All right, Philip is asking why I'm using Ronin versus Moby and to kind of talk about that again. It's been a while. Um, I used to do a ton of Moby I had the M10, I had the M15, I had the Moby Pro, I had all the different free flight gimbals. Um, I'm a big fan of their company. Uh, I consider Tab a friend of mine. And, you know, I just like their brand and their image and kind of what they stand for over there. Um, so, I would love to be using Moby, trust me. But. <clears throat> basically what I have been asked to do more and more is fly these larger, heavier payloads, you know, mini LF and a cook anamorphic and full matte box with the DMX controlled color filter tray and two transmitters, you know, just like all this crazy stuff. And with Moby, it was just becoming a battle anytime I needed to fly more than it could handle. So essentially I've op opened the envelope of what I can fly going to the Ronin. That's a big, big reason. Um, the master wheels were another one. A lot of operators love those. Um, just ease of use. Um, you know, they are, the build quality is really good. The mobile wheels are also really great, but DJI did something with theirs that just, you know, you can plug them in and go and anybody can go up to them and they're familiar. And there's a certain amount of control feel that is a little better on the Ronin when it comes to wheels operating. Um, and I think it has something to do with the packets per second being sent or some kind of a delay. It's really minuscule. You're not going to notice it unless you're doing, you know, super, super precision stuff or have to have perfect reaction time in a scene. Uh, it's going to be great for 95% of work, I would say. But in my business and our business, you know, people just expect this level of perfection that's hard to deliver sometimes. So the Ronin's just allowed me to fall in line a little better with other cameras or other remote heads. And, you know, it has more power, obviously, which is why it can hold more weight. And the extra power gives you the ability to whip pan and without, you know, breaking the torque limit of the motors. So. You have one director out of five who loves whip pans and all of a sudden you're doing all these whip pans. It's nice to be able to have that in your back pocket um, and not have to worry about the motors giving out. So that's kind of a big reason for me. If I was a run and gun shooter or did a lot of like ski or skate stuff, I would totally stick with the Moby being a lighter weight. Um, you know, it just off it, can, it offers a lot that the Ronin doesn't and vice versa. So there's no correct tool it really depends on what you're using it for and what you require out of the remote head so you know i love free fly as a company um, you know dji is this gigantic conglomerate you know billion dollar corporation which is fine it gives them a lot of r d uh, resources but i would much rather support a smaller company built by you know a couple smart dudes uh, in washington than a gigantic Chinese corporation. Although it's funny, I'm shooting something on their camera, which is great. So, you know, you can't complain when they're making awesome stuff, but I still do. Hopefully that answers your question.
Here's the crane. Gabe's here working on something. So this is not here? Yeah. Cause you guys start back up in the Keith too, right? Yeah. A miniature. Oh uh, yeah, we need to go through this uh, toilet paper roll. <laughs> so this is a place called Desmond's Studio Lot, studio parking. And essentially, it's just truck parking for people in the movie business. So you have whole lines of production trucks just as far as you can see in either direction. You know, you got grip trucks, bathrooms, lighting trucks, costume trucks, loads of cool stuff. And you're right on the edge of the Burbank Airport. Right up there, there's the runway. Got a bunch of generators. It's a cool space. So you're right off the airport here. I think there's something taking off. Right up here is Aerie's new building, Aerie uh, Rental and Aerie Burbank. Really nice, nifty building. Um, that's where they run all their operations out of here. They purpose built it, I think, for themselves, so it's brand new. It looks really nice. I kind of ran out of footage for that day, so this is the last shot of the vlog. And you say? Come at me, bitch. All right, hold on. Before you go, yeah, come at me, bitch, and throw it. And then you're, guys, guys, interrupted by Gabriel. Do I throw the backpack at the alien or just down? No, just down. They, you know, you did it. All you wanted to do was get the alien's attention. You threw the Rubik's Cube. You got a back. I got a backpack and a flare gun, you son of a bitch. I like my chances. Just throw the. That's just like that. Do we get one from the other direction? Nope. <laughs> no, the car's going forward. <laughs> 